We are rolling. Who are you and what do you want? My name is Randall Parker Jr. And I have Michael W. Dean. I think the W stands for Winston Churchill. No. <laughs> Wareham. Wherecat. 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 Wheremonster. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Wheremonster. Yep. Wherecat. I like Wherecat. Um Freedom, Freedom Fiend Master Extraordinaire. He's the last remaining capital F Fiend. Well, there's some recruits now, but he's the original founding member. Oh, I think Nima is. He gets to hang up his jersey with uh, no asterisks. I think he's still a capital F Fiend. Oh, cool. He's, he's actually doing like more. I think he's doing more. He quit the Fiends because he didn't have time to do it because he's a new daddy, and I think he's doing almost more interviews lately than. Uh, <laughs> he did an interview with you. He did. Uh, he's doing an interview with Berwick. I'm actually chatting with Berwick right now, uh, giving him audio advice. I give everyone audio advice. You said Berwick. You mean Berwick or Berwick? Um, Berwick. Yeah. Okay. I met, I, him. Sure. I'm, I met him. He didn't pronounce his last name for me. I'm I'm phonetic, it could, man. It could be Berwick. I don't really know, actually. We Jeff, just, the guy Jeff. I think, he, that guy, I think yeah. he's a sponsor on your show, isn't he? Uh, he's a sponsor of the network, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the uh, Dollar Vigilante. Yeah. So what's your <laughs> network? But uh, Voluntary Virtues, or what is this? What are we doing yeah, here? Yeah, so you're on the Voluntary Virtues network right now. Um, it is a brainchild of Michael... Yeah. It's a brainchild of Michael Shanklin. Ah, man, I love that guy. I love that guy, but I've been trying to get him to improve his audio for years, and it's like finally about 5% better than it used to be. He's still got a long way to go, man. We need you at the helm, but if it weren't for that, you should really be like just going around, like fixing everyone's audio, like like a little like audio fairy of liberty. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know about the fairy part, but like you know, because the pixie dust and flying around—that's that's what I meant. Yeah. So you you had me turn my levels down to my headphones for audio quality, and it's so weird because I'm used to hearing myself and, and my guests like really loud, but I want audio quality to be great. Well, do you you can't hear yourself very well? I hear myself okay. Okay. I mean, you could go turn it back up a little bit. And this is a teaching hospital. So, you know, I mean, people have complained, like some of my podcasts, like, you go sound check for the first five minutes. No, we're teaching the audience how to get better audio. So we're having a problem. Uh, we're having a few problems before we started, and we fixed one of them. We'll talk about that. But uh, I was, when I was talking loud, like, loud, loud, I was hearing an echo of myself coming through your headphones, which is a pretty common problem. But I don't think I'm going to be getting that loud. So if you want to turn back up, turn it to your comfortable level. Go to your comfort zone, brother. All right, cool. Let me tweak it up a niggity niggity notch. Yeah. A nizach, as it were. Yeah. All right. I'm up a notch. So the cool thing is you're going to be recording this in audio. I'm used to doing a video show. And when you send it back to me, I can actually edit and do whatever I want and tweak it out. And uh, Yeah. Although, you know, you know me, I'm going to do a little pre-editing to begin with. I'll, you know, some long spaces I'll take out and some, uh, you know, where I go, uh, but, 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 but wait, let me start again. Yeah. And I, I do that, like, I do that at everything I do. Like, the Freedom Fiend stuff is live radio. But uh, when I put up the cat, I record it on my end, and then I put it up within a half hour of the show being over, it's up. And I do so much to fluff and fold it in that amount of time. It's, uh, I don't listen to it and take out mistakes. I do it visually. I've gotten so good at it that I can just open up the timeline and go, okay, there, 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 there. And I take out like, I probably take out 20 or 25 really short little gaps and a couple ums and ahs. I mean, it probably takes six seconds off the length of the whole hour and 20 minute show, but it acts, that actually makes it so much more listenable. It's, it's unreal. So, uh, yeah, I, I care about this stuff because I'm making this stuff for the ages, you know, like, uh, we're on radio where we do podcasting, but really I'm making it for the torrent archives because I want this stuff to be around in a hundred years. And I think that's the best way to do it. And I take the time, you know, I mean, I, I make like 200 bucks a month doing the freedom fiends on a good month working 60 hours a week. But I'm not doing this for the money. I'm not again. I love money. I love making money. I do other things to make money too. But um, you know, like I don't want to put a lot of ads in it. I don't want to have a lot of like live reads. Like, and no, I I want to recommend I use colloidal uranium enemas to keep away the new world order. You know, I don't do that <laughs> stuff because um, I'm making this for the ages. And a uh, hundred years from now, people are gonna be listening to this stuff. And really, people don't really think that much about. Audio quality, they kind of think, oh, good enough is good enough. But 
even people who can't identify and point to and say, well, this is bad audio, this is okay audio, this is good audio, this is great audio, or can't tell you what's good or bad or great about audio, uh, all things else the same, you know, same speaker, same content, same vibe back and forth between co-hosts, whatever. If all that stuff is the same and you have two examples of the audio and one is good and one is great or one is good and one is bad um, – people will intuitively listen to the better audio longer and more often without even realizing it. I 100% agree. Actually, I have a personal account to share in that regard as well because when I first came into Liberty, so to speak, I was a big podcast, um, I guess you could say, uh, getting into podcasting myself at the time. And I was doing it more for professional reasons to, to learn and, and build my uh, marketing craft and learning about internet marketing strategies and stuff like that. But when I found The Fiends... Um, you're right. I didn't notice the audio quality um, specifically, even though I've, you know, I, I toyed around with recording bands and stuff like in college and whatnot, and like I was aware of good quality and bad quality, but it was more of the content that caught me. But then when I started to listen to other Liberty podcasts, especially, um, I'll, I'll call them out because I think Adam Kokesh is great, but even to this date, and he's got a budget, which is crazy. Um, he's the one that needs your help. I feel the most. Um, yeah, he's got you know several thousand dollars worth of gear. I could literally sound better than he sounds with a fifty dollar microphone. Yeah, and it's it's so crucial to because what it is, I would listen to podcasts for four or five hours straight, and I would grit my teeth through the good and the bad audio quality. But I knew that if I ever joined the podcasting world, I wanted to kind of get hit the ground running and have decent audio quality out of the gate. So yeah, well. A big part of his problem is, uh, and this is a big problem with a lot of people who do video casts, he's more concerned about the look than the sound. He's in a metal freaking room. He is in a mm. metal box. That room is a metal box with like metal, you know, it's a big shiny bald box with signs on the wall. And um, I think he's using a better microphone now. You know, a better microphone isn't a matter of price. Like literally... There's a $50 USB dynamic mic that's made for podcasting that I've found after testing over 100 mics for podcasting in the past since 2006 that I'm all the Fiends co-hosts use it. Um, I've bought like 10 of these and given them away as co for contests. That kid, Nick Hazelton, the anarcho yakitalist the 15-year-old kid that's doing uh, a new podcast that I help him set up. His first episode sounded better than, you know, Adam Kokesh's last episode after years. <laughs> and it's because I said, get, I gave him the mic. I told him how to use it. I told him what to do with the room he was in and uh, gave him some tips. I mean, it took, it's not rocket science. It took me like a couple hours. You know, it took me like an hour to teach him audio. And then it took me, me a couple hours to help him set up his blog properly. That's another thing, too, is a lot of people like, they say they have a podcast, but they don't. They've got a collection of talking videos on YouTube. That's not a podcast. And I'm not Michael. What? That is me. That is me, sir. Yeah, I, I, I'm in that boat. <laughs> or, or they do an audio version of it also, but it's hard to find the RSS feed, or it's hard to find the audio, or they don't have an RSS feed. You have to listen to it on SoundCloud or something like that's not a podcast. And I'm not saying like that violates Michael Dean's twelve theses rules <laughs> of podcasting. I'm saying like you're totally missing an opportunity of the beauty of podcasting without that stuff. The beauty of podcasting is MP3s as an enclosure in an RSS feed, period. Boom. Easy to find uh -huh. the RSS feed, top right of your blog. Um, you get a lot more, you know, I mean, like Adam Kokesh is good looking and charismatic and he's a muscle guy. So like sure. it kind of makes sense for him to do video. But, you know, for most people watching them, do a video talk is about as interesting as watching someone check their email. And the the audio is the most important thing. The talking is the most important thing. That's what people should pay all their attention to. The video should be secondary. Um, you know, because because the thing about podcasting, it really is kind of magic. It's it it can replace radio. And most people who talk about podcasting is better than radio. You don't have any rules and you can do whatever you want. Most people that say that don't have a chance in hell of getting on commercial radio. I'm on commercial radio on 25 stations, and I'm still saying that. You know, right. and I'm right. I'm the guy like every every punk rocker that says major labels are stupid, they're horrible. 
and they never these people had never had a chance of getting on a major label. I was I did a record on Warner Brothers. My band Bomb was signed to Warner Brothers. My experience with that has left me saying major labels are horrible. Right. You know, I'm not against commerce, but um media gets chewed up and spit out in most commerce. So, but I, w- I, w- I would know. want to ask you, uh, with regards to major labels too, because I was going to ask you about your media, your music experience. Uh, wouldn't you say, I mean, without all, I, I guess the pill is a poison, kind of a little bittersweet, you would say, but um, doesn't it in the end also just help you get your music out there to more people too, even if it's kind of the wrong way? It's it's really getting out there to a lot more folks, right? With like the budget yeah, you're going to well, get through that. <sighs> that was true 20 years ago. The internet has kind of changed that. I mean, there's still reasons to do things with major corporations. And like I said, I'm not opposed to it. What I do is kind of, um, I make the media in my bedroom and try to make it as good of an, of a technical quality as the mainstream corporate product, but with, you know, without, without the problems that they have with the cool content and without the censorship needed. And then when I'm done with it or when I'm halfway done with it, sometimes I decide how I'm going to distribute it. You know, like last night I did a song with my wife. Um, we put it up on the Freedom Fiends feed as soon as it was done. That song's done. That song's over. That's my extent of it. Uh, you know, sometimes when I work really hard, like with Nima Vidati on a rap song, we'll work on it for a couple weeks. We'll make a good video of it. We'll put it up. We'll really promote the hell out of it. Um, you know, sometimes I write books that are published by major publishers, and the next book I write will be published, self-published. The next book I publish will be published by a small publishing company, and the book after that will be published again by a major publishing company. And when I talk major publishing company, I'm talking about like, you know, I have three books out that are published by the largest publisher of high school and college uh, textbooks in the country. And, uh, you know, I've done stuff for O'Reilly Media. It's like every computer programmer or nerd you've ever met has a bunch of books by O'Reilly Media on his bookshelf. And I'm not bragging. I'm just saying, like... You know your stuff. I know my stuff, and I see the point of... Uh, you know, I came up through punk rock. I'm 50 years old. I played in punk rock bands and put out my first record in 84... You know, and we self-published it. I mean, we we pressed a thousand copies of it. We went into a studio, recorded on tape, saved our nickels and dimes. I actually did like paid drug testing for a government facility. I was a guinea pig oh my God. to make money to put out my first record. Um, and you know, we didn't have money to print the covers, so we had a friend who worked at a you know Xerox place do it in the middle of the night, and then. Uh, we had a party and bought some cheap beer and had like 10 people over and we all sat around and like folded over the covers, put them in a plastic sandwich bag, cut the top off with a razor blade. And that's how we made the covers. That's and, so punk rock. And I like walked into record stores and said, Hey, will you take five of these on consignment? And you know, they, they took them. Uh, sometimes sure. they didn't even pay me later, but I didn't right. care. It was getting <laughs> it out in the world. You know, I've done everything as a lost leader, but somehow made enough money to not starve for like 20 years now. Right. I kind of subscribe to that same viewpoint that if you deliver value in the world just consistently, you'll receive value in return because people will want you around or want your presence in their project or whatever the case yeah. may be. I mean, so you kind of just bring value with your name and with yeah, your presence. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, too, is like a project that doesn't make you money or even loses money, if it's done well, it's still worth doing because it's in, it, you're getting stuff out in the world. And if you're on a mission like I have been every day of my life, you know, it's for liberty now. It was for you know, sex and drugs before that and rock and roll. Uh, but, you know, I've always been on a mission of some kind of like feeling evangelical about what I'm doing. And Speaking of the, if, you sorry, do, if you do that, if you do that, even if you don't make money on a particular project, you're increasing the value of your name as a product. Absolutely. Speaking of the mission itself, um, Roads to Liberty, we kind of have a consistent theme that we like to do on every episode where we let our guests kind of tell a synopsis of their overview. And I, I know that's out there a lot for you, but if you want to give like a 60 second rundown of how you went from status to where you're at now. Okay, I'm glad you asked a question because I thought you were just going to say, give me a 60 second overview of your life look outlook. And I'd be like, I can't uh-huh. do that, but I can answer a specific <laughs> question. Okay. Uh, let's see. Hang on. I'm. I'm. I'm sending. It could be. It could be two minutes. It doesn't have to be sixty seconds. Yeah. It could be four minutes. Whatever you want. Yeah. Um. I would say. Uh. Let's see. What's my road to liberty? I've always been, kind of. Um. 
I've always hated authority, I guess would be where I'd start. Um, I, you know, got in trouble in kindergarten for not respecting the teachers. I wasn't rude. I didn't hit kids. I didn't scream or swear at teachers. I just was really into like, I knew I was smarter than them, than most of them, you know, and the few that were smarter than me, smarter than I, uh, I really dug and they became kind of mentors to me. Um, mm -hmm. but I, at, in kindergarten, I could read, I got picked on because I, the first day of kindergarten, I picked up, you know, a Sally Dick and Jane book and started reading it to the teacher. And she had me read to the class because it was rare that a kid could read in kindergarten what, on the first day. What is, what is a Sally Dick and Jane book? never heard of that before it's uh you're not old enough how old are you uh 31 yeah it's a it was a series you know in the 60s and 70s of simple books with big text and p pictures to teach kids to read gotcha you know it was it was all like dick sees jane jane says <laughs> hi to sally you know it's like kindergarten level reading books for kids uh okay yeah so i was anti disestablishmentarianistic from first from from kindergarten um i got kicked out of boardings i got kicked out i got driven out of high school cuz i was being problematic i got uh they recommended that i go to a all boys boarding episcopal church school called the church farm school i did that when i was 14 uh got kicked out of there at 17 between 11th grade and 12th grade uh for something that they found out i did which was wrote a letter to Mick Jagger telling him to buy the school and fire the headmaster. <laughs> um, and wow. I went to college at 17, lived on my own, went for two years, flunked out of everything the second year except for my, radio, for my broadcasting class. I took a radio class. Um, <clears throat> someone's calling me. What do you want? Skype <laughs> call? Who's Skype calling me? Let me take this. Hang on a sec. Sure. Hello, you're on the air. Hey, Michael. Hey, ben. hey, Ben Stone. Um, I'm doing an interview right now with R.J. Parker. Can I call you back later? He he can stay if he wants. Uh, well, probably not because I don't have phone reception. But uh, anyway, I'll talk to you some other time. Cool, man. Take care, brother. Love you. Bye, bye. Bye. That's cool, man. That was a nice little cameo. <laughs> <laughs> it was not planned. Uh, yeah, there's like four people outside my family that have my phone number or aren't people I like. You know, do business with like publishers and editors and stuff. And Ben's one of them. We talk almost every day. Can I just say that Ben Stone next to the Freedom Fiends and pretty much you, you guys pre talk live and Ben Stone are, are my top three and we and are the top he, three us three are the top three. Good, I'm glad. I'm glad it's official. But he he's like my Liberty grandpa. Like <laughs> even though he's not old enough to really be my grandpa, but like he's kind of there. He's my Liberty. He was, he's my Liberty sponsor. Like an AA an AA yeah. when you're new, you have a sponsor. I mean, I've been at ANCAP for a while, but my joke is that, you know, I, I can call him up at three in the morning and wake him up and say, man, I'm thinking of voting. <laughs> Talk me out of it. <laughs> I'm having sadist thoughts. Help I'm me. having minarchist thoughts. Help me. Yeah. So, but I, when he, when he was, uh, you know, dealing with his medical issues, I was really worried, not worried, but like, you know, nervous. And, uh, it just it was hard for it still is hard for me because he's not out there as much you know he does do a podcast here and there but it's it was I mean having him on a, like almost a daily basis what was it, like a year ago really helped me understand liberty like he he debunked you know Abraham Lincoln and and all the wars and stuff he debunked a lot of stuff that I all these statist structures that were in my mind that I believed in like wow yeah. this war was actually worth it or you know something yeah. like that you know he really helped crumble that yeah <laughs> you guys taught me to laugh at the state that's what yep. freedom fiends really. He, and you guys were the first ones. Too, he helped so. me a lot too. I mean, I was, you know, I was one of these rifle strokers until I started listening to him. You know, mm -hmm. I was one of these, uh, you know, read a lot of Boston Tea Party, read Mike Vandebau, read uh, Unintended Consequences. You know, not that I thought I wanted to go shoot people, but I thought it was like inevitable that everybody into Liberty would turn into a Ruby Ridge within three years. You know, and I yeah. was trying to prepare for it and. God, I haven't even gone out shooting this year, literally. So I need yeah. to soon. But I, I haven't <laughs> shot enough either. I'm new, I'm new at it. I just started shooting a few years ago. I, I've gone like three or four times in my life. But I'll tell you this: I used to feel the same way. I used to kind of casually say before I was actually, uh, you know, a liberty-minded person officially or philosophically in my mind. I used to kind of say to my friends, like, kind of, you know, if this keeps getting worse. You know, I could see there being a revolution, and you know what? I would join that revolution. I would, I would get out there, and I would, you know, because I just fig figured that would be what would happen, and it'd be like a, you know, like your white blood cells in your body attack a, 
an infection and take it over. Like that was kind of my mental picture I had for, you know, shrugging off the state, but then you just have a new state. So, yeah. And it's pointless. And it's like, um, most people that talk about it's time for a revolution have never been in combat. Most people who've been in milit in the military are not quick to jump to that. You know, they're like, cause they've seen it and it's civil wars are horrible, man. People get, you know, tied up and their wives get raped in front of them and people's hearts oh. and hearts get cut out and filmed Gosh. and you know the electricity gets shut off and it's, you it's can't like a get field food. day for for savages like it really the is. savages yeah. among us are like oh goody a war you yeah know? i mean like you know yeah you could probably fend off a couple people trying to house jack you with your ak-47 but like you know, if you're a couple and you live alone, like, do you really want to sleep in shifts and have to be guarding the house 24-7? No, man. God, no. And I like how um, Molyneux has been recently pointing out that, like, or at least debunking, and not just Molyneux, but a lot of liberty-minded folks in the movement are pointing out that without the state, we wouldn't really have wars because there's nothing to, to take over. So maybe there'd be a skirmish, you know, among you know a couple of landowners in a given region, but it would never escalate too far out of that because there's no centralized uh asset to take over which is like the, the helm of the state yeah so but anyway so i back, want to talk to you about well i didn't uh, answer sorry. your i didn't answer your question about my road to liberty oh yeah sorry go ahead see that's that's why i'm i'm the pro because i rem i i i love uh digressing but i also love remembering to bring it back and i do want to talk about the audio thing here before we came on um we connected via skype you don't usually do that and and I'm actually working on something called Fiend Phone. I have an Indiegogo campaign. People can go to Fiend Phone, P, uh, F E E N P H O N E dot com and read about what we're trying to do to improve doing a podcast or radio show remotely to make it better than Skype. But, uh, you connected and you sounded horrible. I mean, I was <laughs> like, man, what mic are you using? It sounded like, um, you were in a room full of machinery with a cheap headset that was on the floor and you were yelling to it in a, in a, ba in a, ba in a bathroom. That's what it sounded like. And you were like, no, I'm using this really good mic. And you told me what it was. And I looked it up and I'm like, yeah, that's the same one Stephanie Murphy uses. She sounds stellar. Why don't you? And, right. and I immediately realized what the problem is because I have a lot of experience doing this. And I, you know, that's part of diagnostics is you've dealt with the problem before. I was, I, I knew I was pretty sure that your sound card wasn't uh, wasn't touching the right audio device, and you were being picked up on your cheap onboard laptop mic rather than your good external mic. And the test for that is really simple: you tap the mic and you tap the laptop, and the person on the other end tells you what's louder. And that's what it mm -hmm. was. And you just change the settings in Skype, and then you sound really good. Yeah, it was your first guess too. Well, honestly, guess, yeah. but your first intuition. Yeah. So my road to liberty. Um, you know, throughout my d adult life. Uh, I, I moved, I moved out of my home really young, like 18 or 17, moved out of my state at 19, like a couple days after college, moved to Washington, DC, wanted to be playing a band, wanted to play in a punk rock band. Cause see, I played most of the things that I've been attracted to, like punk rock and podcasting and the internet and been early adopters of. I haven't really been jumping on a bandwagon. It's more like I've wanted to do this and then there's a way to do it. Like punk rock. Like I, I tried to play in these cover bands when I was a teenager and like, you know, they'd be like, Hey man, you have a lot of spirit, but you know, you're not really good enough to be in this band. And I got, instead of like learning to play like Eddie Van Halen, I got really good at playing the simple stuff and being really melodic in it. And like was kind of playing punk rock before I ever heard of it. And then I was like, wait, there's an audience for this? And I knew it was happening in D.C., so I moved with my friend in D.C., um, <laughs> went, went with my millionaire friend who was summering near me, uh, went and lived in his dad's mansion for about three weeks till his dad came home for the summer and kicked me out. And then I lived in a an abandoned factory in Georgetown in Washington, D.C., but had a job. I got a job working in a sandwich shop. I would like wake up every morning and like tie my tie on in the rear view mirror of a car on the street and then go work. And I mm -hmm. played in a punk rock band, played in a few bands, put out some records, uh, you know, moved to San Francisco, played in Bomb, which is a, which was a kind of popular band. It was a really good band and put out a bunch of records, one of them on Warner Brothers. 
and then got in got a heroin addiction and then uh that broke the band up and then I got clean and at 30 I went to college <clears throat> and uh learned a little bit about computers and like how to do a resume and how to work in an office signed up for temp agencies put a suit back on and went and worked in offices for a while and like while I was doing that then I, th- sometimes while I was at work, like I got good enough to do eight hours of temp work in four hours. Then I would sit there and work on my novel or something. And, uh, you know, got, when the internet happened, I was like, you know, in 96, I had a website. I had that kittyfeet.com domain since 96. It was a different site then. Now it's the Anarchy Gumbo. But I was instantly like, I've been looking for this my whole life. I've been looking for a way to reach the world instantly from where I'm at, you know, because I was always trying to make radio transmitters as a kid and having pen pals from the back of magazines and trying to like reach outside myself to the world. I, I, this sounds kind of specious and like, Oh, I'm important, but I really, I believe this. I feel like I was born the wrong century and on the wrong planet, like either, you know, a hundred years too late or a hundred years too soon. Like the Johnny Cash song says, or uh, or on the wrong planet or something because I've adapted really well to narrow confines of doing things my way on this planet and making a living and surviving and thriving and reaching the world. But the path has gotten really narrow with it to the point where like, you know, when I went to Porkfest, I hadn't been out of my town in like four years, you know, and I rarely leave my property. <laughs> I'm, I'm a recluse, but... You know, I got out and I was like, I wasn't shy. I was fine. I was happy. I was like, oh yeah, I remember humans. These pe- these things, and uh, <laughs> you know, interacted and made you know had a lot of g- g- got to meet my f- internet friends in person and had a great time with them. And looking forward to going back. But um, so during all of that, I was very against authority. But it was weird because I had the status training. Uh, to where like I voted, I voted Democrat and I was really lazy about it. Like I didn't study the issues. I basically thought my vote counts. It's important. And then I'd take out the recommended voting sheet and clip it out of the local like commie free paper, you know, the weekly SF weekly or whatever, and take that in and vote the way it told me to. That's how I ended up voting for, um, Nancy Pelosi once in my life. And I voted for Bill Clinton. Um, and then let's see what happened. I, I was into a bunch of things that were, were kind of marginalized scenes where people look at you weird, whether you do them, you know, no matter what you do with them. Like I was a bike messenger, um, I was a punk rocker, and then I was into like kink. That's how I met my wife. We met on a kink dating website. And all of those things are kind of marginalized, and you kind of have to like put up a front to the world of like, wait, why are you marginalizing me? And it made me really understand, um, you know, kind of like people's prejudices without really looking at it in a political sense. So by the time I discovered the concepts of liberty, which were around the year 2006, I was ready for it. I mean, I I say, I've heard this said, and I believe this, almost believe this, that uh, libertarians are born, not made. And you can't convince someone who is a statist at heart to become a libertarian, and you can tell the difference when you talk to somebody. If you talk to someone who's a libertarian at heart, and they've been indoctrinated like I was, you know, when you when you give them the ideas of liberty and you're logical and kind with them, you don't attack them for being a damn statist. Uh, they they won't instantly get it, but the questions they ask when they say, "Well, what about the roads?" It won't sound like an attack to you or like they're defending their family. It just sounds like they want to know more. And they may not get it overnight. Um, There are people who will defend the state like they're defending their mother. I almost feel like those people are a different subspecies, although that kind of gets into like a eugenics view of the world. And I've no, but I know I know where you're coming from with that. And I don't think I don't think it's that crazy. I really think there's there's I don't say two species because that's a really kind of aggressive two variety, statement to make varieties it's just that two flavors. i feel like some folks like are not even looking for new knowledge they're they're very interested in staying in the cave they like the fire the warmth yeah yeah and then some <laughs> folks are like oh my god i'm in a cave let me get the hell out of here yeah. i want to go see what's outside like there's just two types you know let's um let's pause this for a sec and save sure. the file i like to do that every 30 minutes or so so i don't crash shiny badges on your jacket shiny badges badges 
This is Davi Barker from ShinyBadges.com, and I just want to personally apologize for airing a jingle week after week, month after month, that turned out to be such an infectious brain worm. So to make it up to you, I'm offering a free gift. The next time you make a purchase at ShinyBadges.com, write worms in the transaction comments, and I'll send you something weird. Recording. Okay, so in 2006... Uh, I was, I was recently married and digging my wife. I still love her totally, man. She's like my best friend. We've been together eight or nine years. I don't even remember. I don't even count. It's like every day is our anniversary, you know? Um, yeah, that's really cool. And we were living in California and I was sick and she went to the store to get me some NyQuil and someone tried to break in the house while I was home there alone. And it, you know, it wasn't like smash home invasion. It was basically... Um, somebody was trying to pry the window open with a stick and I actually, the only weapon I had was a stun gun. I I went outside with a stun gun and a telephone and confronted the guy and he wasn't, you know, I don't think he was a violent guy. He was basically, he was like a middle-aged Mexican, probably Mexican national who was like a day laborer. Uh, I found out later who he like smelled like alcohol. I could smell him from like 20 feet away. Uh, what I found out later was there was, like, we lived one of those kind of, like, we owned the house, but it was one of those uh, controlled by a homeowners association, and all the houses looked the same, and yet they're all painted the same. Right. And there was a landlord that owned a house just like it, like, five houses away that had rented it out to, like, 25 day laborers. And I think this guy thought it was his house, you know, I think, oh, okay. and, and didn't have a key. Um, but right. it scared the hell out of me, man. And uh, I... I, the next day, I said to my wife, we're getting a gun. And she said, uh, I don't know, man. Guns are admitting the world's a bad place. And I said, sometimes the world's a bad place, and I love you, and I want to protect us. Right. So we went to a gun store, bought a shotgun, uh, which just seemed like the natural thing for home defense to me. And it's like one of the easier things to own in California. Mm-hmm. There was still a seven- or ten-day waiting list. And during that time, during the waiting list, we like took some gun safety and you know, skill classes at that gun gun store. They had a gun range also. Um, and immediately, like, dug the idea of gun safety and said, you know, no matter how good of a shooter I ever become, I'm going to be absolutely safe and teach people to be safe. Mm-hmm. And I'm still kind of on that mission. You know, I made that DVD, uh, Gun Training with the Non-Aggression Principle, which people can download free on the Fiends Torrent site if you go to freedomfiends.com. You know, I sell all my stuff and give it away, too. That's kind of my business model. And it doesn't make me rich, but I kind of feel like it's more important to me that somebody see this stuff I'm making because I feel it's important for the world than if I actually get paid for that one person, you know. So, uh, so I bought the I bought a few books on shotguns. Oh, and my wife loved shooting, and you know, whereas a few weeks earlier she'd been like, I don't want a gun in the house. As soon as we fired, she fired the shotgun. She said, I love this. I want to get more of these. It's a real, it's a yeah. real exciting thing. You know, thing. I mean, she, cool. she, she now carries a Glock in her purse, a loaded cocked Glock in her purse, a hundred percent of the time. Safety on? There's no safety on a Glock. No. No. So yeah, but it's, how much I know. But it's safe. <laughs> she has a gun, uh, a really nice, well designed uh, carry purse. It's not just like dropped in the top with you know tampons and uh, lipstick. I mean, it's like in the side of it in a zip case or a, a Velcro case. It's uh, right. there's no way it's going to accidentally fire it. Put okay. it that, put it that way. And she is very careful. She knows gun safety. Um, I mean, we're we're gun safety safe to the point where like if we pick up a hair dryer or a power drill, we have our finger on the side of it, like we're holding so, a gun. So just just to interject real quick, do you, do you think I could k- kind of safely say that? Part of what kind of woke you up to liberty was the idea that you kind of start to realize the state wasn't really going to protect you. I, I guess that. Well, that was subconscious. I didn't really think of that even once we got a gun. But uh, I was ordering shotgun books on Amazon, and I got this thing that said people who bought this book also bought. And one of the books was "You and the Police" by Boston Tea Party. And I was like, "What's that?" And I went and looked at it, and I ordered it. And it's a pretty short book. I mean, you can read it in a sitting. I did. And by that time, we had a, we had a handgun. And uh, we were frustrated that we couldn't take it out of the house because it was California. And we looked into getting permits. And we were, we were like 10 feet. You know, we were like 
four blocks from the edge of L.A. County, on the end of L.A. County, like four blocks from Ventura County, you can technically get a concealed carry permit in Ventura County, and you cannot in L.A. County unless you're a movie star or a diamond merchant or a judge. Uh, and literally, like, that, I think, was the realization. It wasn't so much the state won't protect me. It was, wait, if we lived four blocks away we could carry this out of the house and protect ourselves that's ridiculous that's what really yeah. hit it for me and then i read right. you and the police by boston tea party in one sitting i started at like 10 o'clock at night and finished it at like four in the morning and it blew my mind because um i'd read books before like written you know when i was a teenager like i found a book about it was like for drug dealers on protecting themselves from the police but it was like you know, it, it had a lot of criminal talk in it, not just nonviolent things like, you know, it talked about like shooting snitches and stuff. And I was like, that's scary. And I read Boston's right. book and Boston is square in a good way. I mean, he is like he's like Rothbard. Yeah, kind of. uh, like a cowboy Rothbard. I mean, he, okay. you know, he doesn't, uh, you know, he doesn't do dr he does not do drugs. He, you know, he basically it's a book on how to protect yourself against becoming a victim of the cops over nanny crimes. And the, he mentioned something in it about open carry, and I was like, what is open carry? I've never heard of this. And I did some digging, and I realized that in some states, and especially Wyoming, you can open carry a gun without a permit. It's, and then I got on uh, – like basically I went from statist to minarchist in one sitting, from this book and from what was going on in my head before that. And then I got on the Free State Wyoming forum, like, as the sun was coming up, and posted, hey, I'm interested in your ideas. And, like, Mama Liberty immediately replied to me, and I started chatting with her. Do you know who she is? Is she the founder? Or? No, she's the grandmother in Guns and Weed, The Road to Freedom. Oh, okay. She's the 60-something gray-haired granny that open carries into a bank in the movie Guns and Weed, The Road to Freedom. Right, right, right. Um, and... She was really friendly to me and answered my stupid questions about the roads and things like that. And I woke my wife up at like 7 a.m., you know, half hour before she had to get up and get ready for work and said, honey, we're moving to Wyoming. That's awesome. And she was like, what? Uh, okay. <laughs> and like nine, a nine months later, we lived here and it sold that house. Um, yeah. And, you know, it was... I mean, there are unfree people in Wyoming and there are free people in California, but it's like it's a lot easier to be a free person in Wyoming overall for the most part. I mean, you can carry a gun. You can protect yourself. Uh, if you have to shoot somebody in self-defense, you're less likely to go to prison or get sued um, if it's a clean shoot. And, I mean, that's not what I base freedom on. That's part of it. But, you know, there's lower taxes. People are less up in your business. And there's less people. And for me, that's kind of freedom. There's <laughs> less people. Hey, I just did the same thing, actually. Me and my girlfriend just picked up and moved our entire life from uh, one of the statest places in the world, South Florida, Broward County, uh, where she was born and raised, and I, where I moved to back in January just to try out Florida. And, oh, my God, I thought the cops in New Jersey were bad. There where, are cops in Florida. Where are you everywhere now? Everywhere you turn. We are in a little shack in the woods in a nice little town called Ojo Caliente, what, what New Mexico. State? New Mexico, ah. in the northern part, yes, in the hills. You know, I used to own uh, like a half an acre of land in, that, I ne that I never saw in New Mexico. It was in Kenna, Kenna, Kenwick, Kenna, New Mexico. It was it was like 80 miles from Roswell. Okay, a little bit more like, in the center. Yeah, like my grandfather state. wanted in a poker game and gave it, to, and willed it to my dad, and he gave it to me. I I'm actually, actually <laughs> I actually sorry. sold it and bought an AK-47, but. Good trade. I'm actually uh, talking to someone about owner financing a five acre plot in uh, south of Colorado for five grand. I don't mind saying because it it's so cheap, and you know he's going to finance it for me for a year. I got to give him a deposit, but with five acres, um, I'm going to make kind of a liberty commune compound or whatever you want to call it. You know, forgive the terms, but essentially just an enclave where people can post up and do some free market homesteading and. You don't have to pay me anything. The property tax, I think, on the land, if I get it, is I think it's like sixty-five dollars a year, cool. something like that. Cool. Yeah. So. Yeah, the, the um, property tax on my land was like eight dollars a year, and I paid yeah. it for like five years, and then finally just sold sold the land. It was sure. weird too, selling the land. I sold it for six hundred and fifty bucks, and like trying to sell it online, like people thought it was a scam, and I'm like, dude, I'm Michael Dean. You know me. I'm not going to scam. You know, it was like you people know I me. didn't know. I mean, I tried to sell it on, like, some prepper sites, and they all said, like, beware of scam. You know, like, like, dude, you can look this up in the deeds. My name is on it. You can call the county, you know? 
Yeah. So I wanted to go back to your last thing you were talking about and just ask you a little bit more what, what's interesting when you moved from California to Wyoming is there's this idea that when America was formed that we're going to have these states that can be distinct and have their own individual rules so that preference can be acted out within a society. So if people like a lot of guns, you can go to the gun state. Or if you like a lot of drugs, you can go to the drug state or whatever the case may be. <laughs> if you like both, you did, can go to Colorado or Washington. But it, it kind of worked out that way, but it kind of backfired because the federal government just imposes itself everywhere it can. Um, so do you think that having those boundaries where there's different rules was a good idea, or do you think it will never work that well, way? As as statist ideas go, it's, <laughs> it's pretty bold and cool. I mean, most places in the world, uh, the de facto laws – are identical across a nation. There are differences, though, and it's usually customs and local just kind of attitudes, like Canada, for instance. I mean, the gun laws are largely the same across the country, but when they demanded registration of long rifles, you know, Saskatchewan, which is kind of like the Wyoming of Canada, had really low compliance with that. And it's just because they're used to them, they need them for survival, they live in the middle of nowhere, the police take an hour and a half to get to you some places. And just, you know, it was hard to enforce. So there are things like that. And I do believe that America, the, the federal government is trying really hard to uniformize all the laws from state to state through federal laws and through state laws and pushing agendas and suggestions and things like that. Um, and, you know, they're not they're not going with the most lenient laws they're not going they're not trying to average them they're trying to make everyone as tyrannical as the worst states um but i don't know i honestly don't worry as much about tyranny on a day-to-day -day level as most libertarians at least most libertarian media producers of what they talk about maybe i have my head in the sand i don't think i do i mean i was just looking through my twitter feed and saw something about a kid you know shot by the cops um, right. I'm aware of that stuff. And occasionally I do bring it up on the radio, on the weekend shows, because that's when we're, when we're on the most stations. And I kind of feel like it's my duty as someone who has homesteaded 25 slots on, you know, slots on 25 commercial stations. I kind of feel like it's my duty to the world to occasionally get off of just the, hey, we're having fun. This is the Freedom Fiends. We're making fun right. of stuff. This is what we do. You know, what's your cat doing today? What's your audio tips today? And actually go like, by the way, you know, police aren't your friends and they are the enforcers and they will kill you. And here's an example of what they did this week. I do that every couple of weeks because talk radio is a lot different than the Internet. You know, the Internet, people find what they want to find. Talk radio I always you get what you get. I always you tell. Get, you know, I always comes tell. At you. I always tell our co-hosts when they first start, uh, or if I interview somebody, which is rare, I say, "Okay, this is different than the internet. Here's what you should picture: the average listener is a guy who's only going to hear this show for 20 minutes. He's a 73 year old grandfather driving <laughs> driving from church to the VFW picnic with his grandkids in the back seat. So you kind of have to compartmentalize it. You have to like." deliver everything about the concepts of liberty in 20 minutes. Um, I'm never critical of Christianity. I'm not a Christian. I'm basically a deist like Thomas Jefferson. You know, I, I think there's a God, but I think he doesn't care. Is that because Christianity is just so popular that you don't want to just be unpopular in that way? Like you don't want to ruffle feathers? Yeah. That, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, it, put it this way. Um, you know, I'm a deist which is really like not a big part of my identity, you know. I don't yeah. say I'm not a founder of the deist organization or anything. It's it's basically right. like an agnostic who believes there's something, you know. It's mm -hmm. it's I'm not like an atheist. Like they're religious about it usually. You know, I'm not and I'm not yeah. a theist. They're religious about it. But it's like I have far more in, I saw this 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 tweet that summed it up the other day. It was some atheist saying I now have more in common with Christian libertarians than I do with athe atheist statists. And that really nailed it for me. And it's like, um, somebody's religion doesn't, uh, I guess I'm saying I'm a thin libertarian. I'm trying to give a thin libertarian message in a way that won't turn people off based on whatever flavor of other beliefs they have. You know, like, um, mm -hmm. 
I'm I'm personally pro abortion. I never t- almost never talk about abortion on the show because so many people listening to talk radio are so adamantly anti abortion. I never right. talk about Christianity. Um you know, one of my co hosts is a Muslim. I hate to say this. I'm kind of like don't Dottie talk Barker. about that. Yeah, I'm kinda like, let's not talk about that much. Right. I've allowed him to talk about it a couple times in passing. It's kind of self censorship for the purpose of like you know, I'd rather hear you being a great liberty guy and then have people go on your site and say, I want to learn more about that guy and find out that he is a Muslim than get kicked off of radio stations, which is possible if a bunch of people from that town call in and yeah. say, well, you had a Muslim on your show, you know? Yeah. So I, I try to keep it light and um, very, you know, I'm, I'm not being a puss puss. I'm not afraid of losing a station. We're not like making much money at all. Um, but it's more like I work so hard on getting each station and I feel like each one <clears throat> is a black flag, is an anarchist flag, is an ANCAP flag planted on some status territory that gives me a soapbox, you know, and it's like that's precious to me for spreading liberty and I don't want to mess it up by side side issues, you know. A hundred percent. Yeah, I agree with you hundred percent. And eventually another- we will get kicked off the radio. I really believe that uh Mrs. Clinton is going to be the next U.S. president, and I really believe that she is going to kick all of the people who are critical of the, the government off the radio, you know, from us to Free Talk Live to Rush Limbaugh. And I just want to say, too, uh, now that I have you on the show, too, because I want to hear your point on this, your take on this. Uh, I, more than ever, I feel like the elections are completely irrelevant. Would you agree with that? What elections? Uh, like- yeah, right. Like, what elections? Seriously. Wa- watching the last, whatever it was, you want to call it, election, I don't know, the, the parade that they do, the charade, um, I really felt like it was Jack Johnson and John Jackson. It was it was like two <laughs> of the, the same guys. Like, Clones, yeah. We need more war. We need more than more oh, war. Oh, well, we, yeah. There's ne- not enough war. Nima did a great job parodying that in that yeah. video, uh, Obama's Feet Stink, where he, he did white face as Romney, and we did the debate section of that rap video. Yeah, he nails right. it. Right. Yeah, I love I love your guys' uh, music that you've done together. I hope you Thanks, do some man. more. It's, so, uh, it's informative and entertaining at the same time. Yeah, Nima, Nima's, Nima and I are still really good friends. Um, I'm and, glad to hear And that. will be for life. But uh, he's just too busy being a daddy and working two jobs and working 60 hours a week and you know trying to be a dad to his little girl and a husband to his wife to uh, – commit to you know any kind of schedule i mean really it's weird that i'm doing scheduled media which is kind of why like today's my day off and i was kind of like you know you said could we do an interview in the near future at some time and i'm like right now let's do it right now yeah <laughs> you know i'm like right. i have the day off it's it's the it's and not that it was now or never but i was like you know i you you re- i found that at a really good time it was like i've been up a couple hours i was caffeinated I'd answered all my email. Mm-hmm. I'd done all my stuff to wake up. I'd had breakfast. And I was like, what am I going to do the rest of the day? I guess I could clean the house. I don't know. Oh, wait. And I get to talk? Okay. Let's do it. Um, you would have just talked to Ben Stone for the same amount of I time. I probably would have. Yeah. Because he I called mean, you like 10 minutes in. Yeah. Oh, I mean, literally, like Ben and I podcast every day on the phone without sharing it with the world. And sometimes we right. even go, this is great. Why aren't we recording it? And we record it. But, you know. <laughs> I like to be able to walk around the house. Well, what what struck me with you and Nima's dynamic was that you're such a natural conversationalist that you can actually keep a conversation going with yourself as long as you have a little, like you said, you need a little prompting or a little like yeah. volley back from the other side. But Nima would come in with something really intellectual or cl- clinical, or you have him read something, which is almost like he would be like, okay, and then like he'd be like, like doing your little task, and then he'd try to go his own direction, and you'd go your own direction. It was like this cat and mouse of like, and there was a the ongoing themes of the fiends that I don't know if you guys intentionally planned it out or if it just kind of happened, but like, you know, what did Obama do to, to you or, you know, um, um, uh, gosh, there's so many, um, tyranny today, freedom, tyranny freedom today. fix. Yeah. I mean, we yeah, worked, we worked really hard exactly. on it and Nima is brilliant and he and I had an amazing, uh, back and forth to the point where, I mean, I've actually, a lot of people like the new show with 12 co-hosts, and the 12 co-hosts are really great. And part of it is I'm being the Liberty College of teaching people how to do live radio to replace me, you know, to keep this going. Because really, there's only, you know, there are a couple hundred syndicated radio shows in the country, and only two of them are talking about real liberty. It's Austin Free Talk Live. 
but there needs to be more. And, you know, when they kick everybody off radio, it, it's going to all go to the internet. And as much as I dislike the, like, interruptions of, you know, the ads on talk radio and the confines of being at the same place at the same time, I think if we got kicked off radio, um, I think I would still do at least a couple days a week, you know, like an LRN type thing of like to a, to a show clock and automated and with ads and stuff. Cause I kind of like the format and I want to teach other people to do it. I've actually had a couple people say <laughs> they've stopped listening to the fiends because without Nima, it's not what it was. And, um, you know, I always dislike it when like a band I like, you know, Someone who's really important, like the guitarist or the singer, leaves and they replace him and keep the band name. I think that's cheesy. Like I always like the Discord, actually uh, the Discord record I was things. Just say that. Starting yeah. a new band, you know, they I always start a new band even if the that. drummer left. They'd start a new band and write a whole new yep. set of songs and put out a record. But um, you know, and there's a certain purity to that. But usually, the reason people keep together with the same band in that situation is economic reasons or because the whole band has become their whole identity. Um, I don't make a living at Liberty Media, and I recommend that nobody try to, because then you end right. up compromising it, you know, not necessarily putting ads on, but like, like Stefan Molyneux, like every once in a while, he just sounds like a televangelist yelling at people for not giving him enough money, and it's ridiculous. It's, uh, and just because you make some money at, this is what like doing all this media my whole life and making some money at it has taught me, is like, just because you're making money at something right now, there's no guarantee you'll be making money at that in a year. So diversify. Sure. And so a few people have been like, oh, man, it's not the Fiends anymore without Nima. And it's like, if we were not on radio, I probably would have changed the name of the show and the format of the show. I would have done the same thing with the 12 Coast, but I wouldn't have kept the name. Nima gave me the blessing to keep the name. And the reason I kept the name and kept it going is because we've stay I have staked out those flags, those ANCAP flags on the statist world of radio. And that's really hard to do and it would be really hard to start over with a new name and do it again. And mm -hmm. I think it's important to keep that uh keep 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 that that land held, you know. And you know, we, right. we get kicked off radio in three years by the president, uh I'll probably keep the name by then because by then I will have homesteaded it with the new people enough that that will be the Freedom Fiends. And, uh, but actually, there's some stars starting to, to emerge, man. Um, everybody's good, but I think Davi Barker is kind of turning into the new Nima Vidati. He and I are great together. And you know what? He's the most improved yeah. player, and I built that because Nima and I interviewed him on The Fiends two years ago. He was horrible. I interviewed him around he, the same he time. He has really changed. I interviewed he has really him changed. on his, uh, the Anarchy Gumbo. His personality. And afterwards, you know, Nima was like, oh, how'd it go on the gumbo? And I'm like, uh, you can listen to it if you want, man. It's pretty boring. That guy's not very good on radio. <laughs> but uh, he's great now. He's stellar. And he and I have developed such a good back and forth where it's like, we can talk about nothing, and it's great, like with Neem and I. And uh, when we talk about something, it's even better. So Davi, your last show at your last show with Davi was really good. Yeah, man, I loved it, and yeah. and I like Lou Sanderfine a lot too. He's good too. He's kind of um, quiet and understated, but there's yeah, it's he's funny as hell and he's smart, so it's good. Mm -hmm. um, they're all good. Diana mm -hmm. is really funny. Diana, she's cool. I built her too. I was like, she'd never been on a microphone before, and I was chatting with her on email. She was a Fiend fan, and uh, I was like, "Hey, I'm uh, going to be adding some co-hosts. Do you want to?" You know, I said, "Get this mic, get this fifty dollars mic, the USB two zero zero five, which I recommend to everybody." And I said, "Get that mic and just call in some night on Skype, and we'll check you out." And uh, I did, and it was great. And you know, she she's funny. She laughs all the time. It's good. It's good radio. But she's got a really cool voice, like yeah. a nice voice for radio. Yeah, and I don't want to like, you know, not go through all of them one by one and name them all. They're all good, but it's like they I are. just really noticed the thing with Davi and I getting almost magical. No homo. I was gonna say that uh, kind of what you went through the the transition is almost like if you really love a band and then they break up, but like different members go into new projects or someone starts a solo project. It's almost like hating on the band if you don't check out the new projects. You know what I mean? Like I would be <laughs> yeah. excited. Like, yeah. Um, do you know who Ted Leo is? No. Okay, there was a band called Chisel in the mid to late '90s, kind of like uh, indie shoegazy kind of punk rock, and it's really good if you want to go back and check it out. Really male, high pitched kind of vocals and punk rock sounding cool, melodic emo. And then that broke up, and I guess it was kind of a bad breakup. But I found him 
years later, I was at a Ted Leo on the pharmacist show. I didn't realize it was the same front man. And the music starts and the vocals are unmistakable. So I was like, oh my God, this guy sounds just like Ted Leo. I didn't even know what Ted Leo looked like until I got back to my dorm and searched him online. And I was like, oh my God, it's the same guy. So I became a fan of the new band. And I was actually on Twitter talking to him in like 2009, 2010. And we were going back and forth, and I, I thought it was going great until I said, "Man, I really love Chisel. You know, I I really wish you, uh, you guys didn't break up. You know, I, I love that material." And he's like, "Dude, that's a soft spot or sore spot for me, man." He's like, "That's a bad time. I, I don't look back on that favorably." And like, I really wish you hadn't said that. And I was like, "Oh man, I really offended him." And I was like, "I didn't mean it like that." You know, I love Ted Leo and the Pharmacist, and he's like, "Yeah, man, I just uh, you know I had a bad uh, ending with that situation." And like, I just, he you know, probably, he probably, hears, is so he probably personal. hears that ten times a day too. You know. Yeah, and his new material is great too. So I, I didn't want him to feel that way. <laughs> but yeah, it's cool though. I, I know you focus on how you can reach anybody on the internet too. So yeah, I've actually, um, I've, I actually learned really early on that it's better not to meet my idols. I mean, I don't really have idols, but people I look up to, um, <laughs> you, you know. Uh, you meet them and they disappoint you no matter what because they're human. It's better to just enjoy their their music. Like I remember the band Flipper. Uh, I was a big first adopter of Flipper in the early '80s, and I went backstage to meet them with my girlfriend at uh, the 9:30 Club in DC, and <laughs> they were like, "Why don't you get the f out of here, man? But your girlfriend, can, right. But your girlfriend can stay." <laughs> there's a there's a band I really dig called Have Mercy right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're on a label called Top Shelf records which has a lot of bands that i really love right now yeah and uh they just had all their stuff stolen out of their tour uh van in uh new york in uh albany new york right and uh so i I, on the comment thread on facebook i go we should do like an indiegogo or a kickstarter or something um to help them raise the money and i was like i would love to help out with that you know someone pm me and I'll, i'll get it started you know and uh, no one says anything to me at all, which I'm not complaining. I still love this band. Like you said, I did, going into their world almost is lackluster. It's kind of disappointing. But So no one says anything to me. And then a few minutes later, like a half hour later, there's a GoFundMe campaign posted off their page. Like, help, help, have mercy, raise money for their new gear. And like, no one asked me if I wanted to help or if I would share the link or anything. I'm like, okay, that was totally my idea. But you guys run with it. That's cool. Like, no problem, you know? Yeah, fundraising is a weird, uh, a weird egg. I was kind of down on it for a while, but I've actually done a few lately, and I'm doing one now. And I guess I was down on it because I did it before the internet, and automating it on the internet seems kind of like cheating to me when I first heard it. And that was one of the few things I've been mistaken about. Another one was I said YouTube won't catch on, and no one should use it, and you should host videos on your own site. Those are like right. the two mistakes I've made in my life, but uh, I know when I'm wrong. Uh, I'm looking at Ted Leo. This is kind of a small world thing. Ted Leo is a preppy, but, but also a preppy like me. He went to uh, Seton Hall. My my school, Church Farm School, used to play them in sports games. Okay. But I don't know. Yeah, him. my buddy's He's, went to Seton Hall, too. I'm uh, six years older than him. The party there a little bit back in the day. Yeah, Seton I've, Hall. Wrestled, I've wrestled people from Seton Hall. <laughs> there so, was a shooting on that campus one time ugh. in like... Oh, five or something. Yeah, and they I, the the reason I at six hours my friends were going there at the time and like uh, they give you a free laptop when you go to Seton Hall and then there was some controversy because they thought that the laptops were being used for like scams and like sex rings and crime rings and stuff like that. It was a cra- that, just New Jersey is a cluster uh, f of uh, uh, yeah. Just it's because of the it's actually the most densely populated state I believe in the country. So. There's just so much crap taking place there. But so, is that your only link to Ted Leo, or was there some other stuff? Yeah, I mean, I remember, I remember his band Citizens Arrest, but I never played with him. Um, hey, let's let's uh, uh-huh. save this and then come back and finish up. Okay, sounds good. Cool, man. Hi, this is Michael Dean from the Freedom Fiends Radio Show. The internet has lowered the cost barrier for a worldwide radio show to a price approaching zero. Yet there is one arena where you still need thousands of dollars to approach the audio quality of the corporate media. Doing a live spoken show with more than one host in different geographic locations. Our program, Fiend Phone, will solve that problem, and it will be given away free. Go to fiendphone.com to see what you can do to help. That's F-E-E-N-P-H-O-N-E. Dot com. We're recording. Yeah, I want to promote my thing, too. Sometimes I just get so into talking, I forget to pimp the thing that I'm supposed to pimp. <laughs> right, right. Well, what is Fiend Phone, and how is it going to change 
everything for podcasters. Okay, Fiend Phone is something that I'm working on with Derek Slopey, who's the programmer who did Meowbit, which was the uh, the thing that we made for Namecoin for viewing dot .bit domains. And he is really visionary, and he's a good programmer, he's a good guy, and he does what he says he's going to do, which is very important. You know, I've talked to some other people who are like, yeah, I'd like to chip in on your project, but, you know, I've hired programmers before, and then they've, like, done a bunch of work but not finished, and I've owed them money. And I'm like, that's not my guy. That's not this guy, you know. Um, right. I like to do projects with people that – I've done projects with before who've done well, you know. I kind mm -hmm. of uh, tend to work with the same people over and over and over, which is one reason I loved working with Nima because he was always – he always did things perfectly and, and quickly and creatively. And um, it's kind of a drag that uh, that he's not available anymore. But, you know, that's another thing too. It's like don't just diversify the – projects you do for for money and for fun but also diversify the people open source the the people so you don't have i don't like to have any single single point of failure in anything i do whether it's you know technology or people or projects or whatever and um you know you were talking about the guy who is like resentful of like oh i don't want to talk about my band it's like i was in a band that you know did some things and was commercial you know commercially successful to an extent and made a living at it for a few years and toured America a bunch of times and toured the world and made great records and people dug it. Um, there's two of those guys I will never speak to again. One of them is a sociopath. The other is such a statist that he just, like every time he talks to me, he just basically says I should be institutionalized because I don't want to vote for Obama. Um, so I don't talk to people like that. The, and, one of the, and the other guy I talk to, you know, uh, occasionally, we're still friends. But if you bring up that band... There's no way I'm going to say, dude, I don't want to talk about that. I'll talk about it until the cows come home because I'm proud of it. I'm, I'm pleased with it. The music was great. It, it nearly killed me. Uh, and two of the guys are, you know, I won't talk to, but I'm not going to be a puss puss about it and be like, oh, I can't talk about it, you know. And the reason is, is like, I would be willing to bet that guy bet his whole life on those three other guys and probably had financial arguments with him and whatever. And it's like, I don't like to get into situations where I feel like I'm in jail. And I right. have felt that way creatively with people that I've been working with before. And it's like once you're into a project that's big and it has some funding and it's got some game and it's going somewhere and it, and it feels worthwhile, which is why you did it in the first place, um, you know, people tend to stay in those bad marriages because they don't want to uh, – those bad artistic marriages because they don't want to give up the project and start over again. But uh, I've gotten to the point in my life over the last 10 years where I'm like, I will cut anybody out of my life permanently with one phone call and never speak to them again and just delete everything they send me rather than, mm -hmm. deal, rather than deal with crap like that, you know? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I've found this great, guy, this great guy. He's a friend of mine. We hung out at Porkfest. We know each other. We've spent a million hours on the phone talking. Derek, and I've seen him work, and he's great. So I've been frustrated – ever since I started podcasting, that there wasn't a great way for two people in different locations to sound like they're in the same room. And eventually, in the past couple of years, a few things have come out that can do that, but they're not open source, they're not free software, they're not free. They cost like $400 for two people, up to like $3,500, depending on what you get, whether it's software or software hardware. And I know this isn't rocket science. I know it can be done. I've talked with this programmer about it. It can be done. Um, and we're raising money to basically pay him to do it. And maybe we might need to get one other programmer for a short section of it to work on the, uh, the audio inputs to the codec we're using. You know, And we've actually talked to this guy who worked on – the open source codec opus that we're going to use. Like he might be the guy we hire um, nice. when we get to that point. So yeah, we're trying to raise $20,000. Um, you know, we'll, we'll work on it if we don't make that much, but if we don't make that much, it's basically going to be, this guy's going to be working for free and I don't want to ask him to work for free. And if he's being paid, he can work on it and hit it hard and do it, uh, proactively and regularly until it's done rather than, oh, I can work a few hours a week here and there and, you know, it gets done in two years. Uh, I'd rather it get done quickly. We're going to give it away. Um, 
basically the options people have for doing it now without paying money are you know skype google hangouts blink team speak um you know mumble there's a couple more the right. thing the thing is those are not made for what we're doing those are made for usually for gamers for like 10 or 20 gamers in a crew or a, a group you know team whatever they call them you know those those packs of gangers that roam the internet uh, clan a clan yeah like 10 at 10 of the 10 or 10 10 to 100 of those people all on cheap headsets all yelling and um that has a lot different technological needs than two people with good microphones in a good room uh just talking to each other the difference is um all of those protocols and programs work through a central server which adds latency we're going to go peer-to-peer point-to-point p2p um which you know has some issues too. It has some security issues that we're going to have to overcome. Um, it has some networking issues we're going to have to overcome. But it can be done. I've seen it done, but it's in proprietary software that costs a bunch of money. You know, I don't want. Um, we want to build it from the ground up. And those other programs are made for, you know, crappy mics. Uh, basically, they're made to work. With any mic, they're made to work okay, kind of so-so, with any mic in any environment. We're trying to make something specifically to sound great with a good mic in a good environment. That's the difference. Yeah, and I I, I was going to say, too, that um, I have a little background in software development. My father was a tester my whole life, software tester, so he worked on software projects my whole life. And I've worked with a couple startups so far in my career helping them more so with marketing, but I've watched the software process go. And I've worked on one project specifically, Calling Bolt, which you can go see at callingbolt.com. They, it's like a Google voice, but you pay for it, and you're not the product, you're the customer. But that costs a million dollars to build. So if you can build a replacement for Skype that is suited for just podcasting and, and what we're doing, and it's only $20,000, you talk about maybe a 1,000 people giving you 20 bucks each, yeah. Um, most expensive software would be at least a hundred dollars for a license or two hundred dollars for a license. Yep. You're getting something that's functional out of the box for a twenty dollar donation, and there's got to be a thousand podcasters out there that could use it. You know. Yeah, and you know you deal with a lot of uh, what the liberals call the free the free rider problem with something like that, but uh, you know because there's a lot of people who are going to use it and will never give money or won't give any upfront when we need it more than when it's done. Um, right. But. And, and people have asked me, like, you know, businessmen have asked me, like, well, why don't you raise $20,000 from investors, make this as a product, and sell it cheaper than the other things for, like, 50 bucks? And I'm like, right. that makes sense as a business model, but it doesn't make sense as a, I want to improve liberty, you know? And, mm-hmm. of course, this will be available to status also, but um, I don't really care about that. I care specifically, and I don't look at it as competition. I look at it as, like... You know, other other podcasters talking about how great the state is isn't the competition. The competition is Bill O'Reilly, Glenn Beck, and Barack Obama. You know, Plus, because well, <laughs> what's that? I was gonna say once once you get investors as well, you're gonna have like you know board members and shareholders. You're beholden. And then, like, you're beholden. You, yeah, Skype or somebody comes in and wants to buy you out, and now you have to sell out, and it defeats the whole purpose or something. Yeah, you know? and they would. And uh, we're putting this up open source, GNU licensed. So literally, there's not a problem with somebody trying to buy it out because they could just take it which i don't care right. because you know my primary goal is to improve the sound of liberty audio i really think that we need to sound as good as bill o'reilly and glenn beck and barack obama do when they speak on the radio and that's not happening yet because those people can buy a hundred of the three thirty five hundred dollar boxes no problem you know they don't even know what those boxes are they just talk into a mic um but you know i want to improve I don't my primary thing is wanting to improve the quality of liberty audio but my secondary thing is wanting to improve the audio of the world because I'm frustrated you know I would like to see this thing adapted for cell phones I would like to see uh you know um a cell phone modern cell phones they're not even called cell phones mobile phones because they're technically not using cell infrastructure with the radio network anymore they're phones mobile phones you know an iPhone an Android phone uh Windows phone those things still sound like crap when you make a phone call, but they can record stellar audio. I've had people actually record voiceover for me 
on an, on an iPhone and send me the file, mm. and it sounds great. You know, if they're in a room that's not too echoey and they speak clearly and not with a lot of dynamics and speak about, you know, six, eight inches away, it sounds great. So those phones have the capability of doing it. Um, the network is the problem, and the networking is the problem, because most people don't clamor – like, most people use those things for texting and sharing videos anyway. They don't even talk on them for the most part, but – I guess this is something that I I have taken up as a banner of improving audio, spoken audio in the world uh, as a thing that really irks me, and I don't believe I don't understand why it doesn't irk more people. But it's the kind of thing again. Like I opened with this, I'll close with this, saying that uh, most people can't specifically point out problem audio or say what's wrong with it, but all other things considered. They'll listen to the good audio longer and more often, and that's that's all I'm trying to do. And you know, I've actually had people say like, "You're trying to raise twenty grand? What are you greedy?" And I'm like, "You don't understand." Anybody who would say that doesn't understand the realities of software development, as you put it. Like, you know, it's not uncommon for someone to spend a million dollars making something like this, and we can get it done for twenty grand. So go to fiendphone.com and send us a dollar. <laughs> Send them like 20 bucks, actually, there you go. if you can. That'd be great. And, uh, Michael, thank you so much for being on my program. And uh, it, it was a great honor for me to have you. And I think you definitely you know, dropped a lot of wisdom on my, uh, on my audience. And I can't wait to get this uh, out there for people to, to feast on. And thank you for the audio help, too. Yeah, Appreciate man. that. It's been a great honor to be on. Thank you. Thank you All for right, your buddy. service. Thank you for yours. Worms. Worms. Talk to you later. Yep.